Welcome to the next lesson. Today we're going to talk about Act 2 of the play. It's very exciting and I want to pause here for a moment to kind of do a quick review for Lesson 1. Lesson 1 I introduced some of the ideas from Aristotle on what makes a tragedy. Let's check right now and see if Romeo and Juliet following this rule of Aristotle. So we need a few things. First of all, we talked about or considered what makes a tragedy tragic and not just sad. We need tragic characters. Now, so far we have Romeo. Is Romeo a tragic character? He needs to be a tragic character and he needs to have tragic flaws according to Aristotle. What we were saying that he is too confident. You can see that already. And we're trying to identify that his confidence is suggested to come from his being young. Now we're going to meet Juliet in more detail and we'll see if Juliet a tragic figure or not. And I think that we'll see that she is. Another thing that Aristotle says we need to have is a point of discovery where the characters find out that they get themselves in some kind of trouble. So we know them that already because at the end of Act 1, that one is the capital and one is the Montague from the two families. That's point of discovery. I want to add one more thing to that, that we haven't talked about that. Another quality of drama is that drama should has the three unities. Unity of time, unity of place, and unity of action. Now, does Romy and Juliet have this? So far, it seems like it does. Unity of place is that it takes place in Verona. They, they don't travel all over the world, just one location. Unity of action. This play is all centered around one idea, the love of Romeo and Juliet. So it doesn't have a lot of different plots. There are a few subplots, but mainly centers around one action. Lastly, does it have a unity in time? Yes, the play which we haven't finished, but we will see. It all happens just in a few days. Okay, so let's go a and go read Act 2, which begins with a chorus. This will be the last chorus in the play. There is no choruses in um, other acts. So it sums up the action so far. Let's look just um, at a few key lines. First, we see that dichotomy between the old and the young in the play again. Now, old desire does in this deathbed lie, all desire and young affection gapes to be his heir. All desire, young affection. This is going to be continuing throughout the play as we've already seen. We also learn about Juliet. Why does she like Romeo? The quote is the charm of his looks. Romeo is a good looking guy. Later on, the nurse is going to tell us that Romeo is very handsome. So that might be part of Juliet's flaw to make her tragic is that she cares too much about the guy's looks and not his substance. Because actually Paris would be a better choice for her as a husband, which is what the nurse says as well and her mother tells us it's true. We also see in the chorus that they have some blocking forces. Romeo's book blocking force, the chorus tells us, being held a foe, he's the Montague, he's the main enemy of the Capulets, he may not have access. He can't get to Juliet or talk to her. He has to climb over the wall. That's a blocking force. For Juliet, her means much less to meet her new beloved anywhere. This is actually historical. In a, this time period, women were not allowed to just do whatever they want. They are supposed to stay home. This is the 1600s in England. Of course, it's Verona, but it's written in England. Okay, so let's go jump into the act after we've seen the chorus. Romeo meets with his friends again and Mercutio, um, Benvoli and Mercutio. They see him, he goes to talk to the Juliet, but they talk about him and wonder what's going on. And they still think that Romeo is in love with Rosalyn, so he hasn't been talking to his friends. So, Marcuccio says around line 7 or 8 of scene 1, he says these lines. Romeo, humors, madman, passion, lover. He has these quick, different identifications of who Romeo is. There's a sense of Romeo not being himself. He's many things. 
But later in the play, Marcucci is gonna say, now thou art Romeo. So we're seeing Romeo as character goes through development, but he's not sure who he is. When he discovers his love of Juliet, he finds his identity. Okay, so what I wanna go ahead is jump to scene two, very famous scene, you're probably already familiar with it, that's when Romeo has arrived um, in their um, Capulet's house, he sees Juliet on the balcony and that's called the balcony scene, that's actually a trope. You see in many movies, the guy is calling to the woman uh, from far away, so Romeo comes up and he says Juliet standing and he says these lines. He jests at scars that never felt a wound. The stage direction tells us Julian enters at a window. Let's pause and talk about the setting. How would I present this on the stage? Well, I'm gonna have Juliet up here, high, the spotlight on her, the trees, and maybe I want to really show the distance between them. How high do I want to put her on the second floor, third floor? We also think about the setting. The distance is clear between the two. The Romeo wishes to close the distance, but he cannot, that's the obstacle. But also Romeo is down here and Juliet up high. This is odd because the female character are put in a strong role of being dominant over Romeo and Romeo is submissive. Romeo is describing her as the sun. The sun is a masculine symbol comes from the Greek god Apollo, the Roman god Phobos, which is a male god, yet Juliet, a female character, is a dominant role and is compared to the sun. This is interesting. The Shakespeare is quite different from his contemporaries, uh, people who were writing at the same time. He has many strong female characters, Lady Macbeth, and now we have Juliet, another strong character. Let's have a look at the imagery that Romeo presents to us. He says that Juliet is the sun and he says, arise fair sun and kill the envious moon. The moon will be the feminine archetype and he wants Juliet to destroy that feminine side. In other words, he wants to empower her. That's very interesting for his love, not to make her submissive like Paris would, but to empower her. In light 10, he says, it is my lady. Oh, it is my love. There is a sense of possession here, too. So we see that Romeo is not totally giving himself over to the dominant power of Juliet, but he too wants to possess her. And later, Juliet says, I want to possess you like a tiny bird in my hand and a prisoner. He says a lot of things that relate her to light sun, line 15 stars, line 20 brightness of her cheeks, 20 carrying over daylight doth a lamp, light 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 and i mentioned that you should look for those images and then he says to her he listens to her speaking in like 20 he says as glorious to this night being over my head that's a good quote if i was writing a paper to show that she is up high in a dominant position and he overhears juliet speaking and hear what she says oh romeo romeo wherefore art thou romeo very famous lines, deny thy father and refuse thy name. And here she talks about names. This is what I want you to think about for a moment, naming. How important is naming? Because when she sees what's in a name, a rose by any other name will still feel sweet. The name is not very important. Now talk about a character trying to attain identity. Well, our names are not our own. Our names are given to us by our parents. So. What can we do to make our name our own name? That's what Juliet's kind of trying. Deny thy father, deny the identity he placed on you as the man take you, throw it away and take up this in you identity with my love. And Juliet needs to do the same thing. Tis but thy name, thou art, art thyself. That's an interesting distinction that we are not what our parents say we are. This is a story about young people making mistakes, big mistakes, but in the end, we're doing what all are trying to do. We're trying to find our identity or to name ourselves. Then she says, what's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other word would smell as sweet. So the name is not important by the essence in line 48. And for thy name, it is no part of thee. 
Okay. For this, I want to pause for a second and think about how language is constructed. From that will be the last stop for this lesson. Language comes from us calling the names that are absolutely arbitrary. So it says a rose is still a rose, even if you call it something else. Romeo is still Romeo. However, we have a sense we make a mistake when we think that the name is the thing. That's the mistake that Romeo and Juliet do not make though. They Juliet sees quite clearly that Romeo is not the thing we call him, and Juliet knows that he can be quite different. And Romeo, Romeo knows that too, because he's not treating Juliet as her name would make her be treated as a woman. Instead, he empowers her. She is over my head. She is not that name that was given to her by her mother, the name of a girl that should be conservative and marry someone like Paris. Okay, I want to pass here on this lesson because that's a lot to take in. And then next time we'll continue through this when Romeo and Juliet actually speak to each other because now he just overheard her. She doesn't even know that he's there yet. So let's do that for next time.